The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the war against President Trump. Brent Bozell unmasks the radicals in the mainstream media and reveals the threat they pose to our country. Plus, Duck Dynasty's Alan and Lisa Robertson and their real life drama, Too Hot for Reality TV. Uh, I don't want you here. Uh, I don't want you in our house. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. It's a shocking truth. Tens of millions of Americans are at the mercy of cyber attacks. Why? Because government agencies are failing to protect their information that's online. A shocking new report reveals some issues that go back more than 10 years. Our CBN News national security correspondent, Eric Phillips, has more. And we're talking about agencies like Homeland Security, Social Security, and the Department of Education, all with holes in their cyber protection that could allow a hacker to wreak havoc on millions of Americans. The report exposes how eight agencies failed to address cyber weaknesses identified by the Inspector General more than a decade ago. The Social Security Administration alone risked the information of more than 60 million Americans who received benefits. The report revealed that since 2011, the Education Department has been unable to prevent unauthorized devices from connecting to its network, giving hackers 90 seconds to access information more than enough time for someone who knows what they're doing. It's critical for Washington to really clean up its own house. Trevor Logan is a cyber expert with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. It's a huge attack vector that we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to uh, for an adversary to respond. His concerns echoed by Don Murdoch with the Institute for Cybersecurity at Regent University in Virginia. Murdoch trains people in government and private companies to become cyber defenders those who can recognize system vulnerabilities, expose a cyber attack and stop it. He says the threat is real and growing. If you look at what's occurring uh, globally, there are over 300 well-identified attack groups that have names or numbers that we know about that are operated by foreign service. With ongoing tensions in the Middle East, officials believe Iran is ratcheting up the cyber attack strategy, even using so-called cyber proxies against the U.S. Other likely countries include China and Russia. There are several recommendations when it comes to strengthening cybersecurity of government agencies. Among them, giving chief information officers greater authority over decision making about cybersecurity. Those officials would also be required to regularly report their progress to agency heads and ultimately to Congress. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, I want to tell you, Regent University uh, has been named a National Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education. Uh, and we have a BS in cybersecurity, and that was a approved and sanctioned by the National Security Agency, NSA, and the Department of Homeland Security. Regent is already training uh, members of the Navy Cyber uh, Defense uh, Force here in uh, the North Atlantic uh, uh, well, NATO uh, and also uh, the uh, uh, Tactical Air Command over in Langley. So I'm, I'm pleased to report we're at the cutting edge. I think there's one of the few uh, universities in America that has its own cyber range. And so when Eric was there, he was on our cyber range, which we use to train people how to ward off these attacks, what's coming. And we're also going to get the, the government wants us to have an attack mode so not only do we are able to receive attacks, we're also able to launch attacks. <laughs> and that's the big deal of what the president was doing against Iran and possibly against uh, Russia. But anyhow, if you are interested in, in only 4% of the universities in our, in our nation uh, received this award from the NSA, but it, it's 1-866-910-7615. So if you're interested in a degree or a certificate, because Regent is now giving certificates uh, so people can become cyber experts and get enormous numbers of jobs available, at least one million jobs, high-paying jobs, 
uh, in cybersecurity for people who are properly trained. And I don't know of any other university in America that has a cyber range as sophisticated as Regent University. It's kind and, of exciting. And one that's working so closely with the military right here. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, the government right now is saying well, we want to, to build up a, a private force of people who know how to ward off hacking and also to hack others. So in other news, speaking of Congress, Congress is compelling former special counsel Robert Mueller to testify about his Russia report. John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. Robert Mueller is scheduled to appear before Congress next month on July 17th after the House Judiciary and, and Intelligence Committees issued subpoenas to Mueller. They want to question him about his report on the Russia investigation. President Trump calling this latest move in a tweet presidential harassment. His attorney, Jay Sekulow, says Mueller's testimony likely won't differ from the report and that he should also answer questions about irregularities during the investigation. Meanwhile, a new poll conducted by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee found voters believe House Democrats are too focused on impeaching the president. While a shocking new image shows the danger faced by migrants crossing illegally into America, a 23-year-old father and his daughter drowned in the Rio Grande this week. The father placing the girl on the U.S. shore before going back for her mother. She jumped in after him and both were swept away by the currents. Tuesday night, the House passed a $4.5 billion bill aimed at easing the humanitarian crisis on the southern border. It provides funding for food, water and shelter for migrants entering America at the southern border. It also calls for stronger measures to care for children in U.S. custody. This after revelations of terrible conditions at detention facilities on the border. The White House has threatened to veto the bill. It favors a Senate version that also strengthens border security. All this as new, board, uh, new Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Mark Morgan takes over today. Former Commissioner John Sanders announced his res resignation Tuesday. Well, turning overseas, the crisis with Iran has America seeking more allies in the Middle East. Recently, U.S. Christian leaders met with some of America's strongest supporters in the region. They found the Kurds of northern Iraq willing to partner with the U.S., Israel and the global Christian community. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports. In September 2017, the Kurds of northern Iraq voted overwhelmingly for independence. While they celebrated, much of the world either ignored their accomplishment or punished them economically. Because of a long history of betrayal, a Kurdish proverb says, the only friends we have are the mountains. One goal behind this visit is that one day Christians around the world would become better friends to the Kurds than these mountains. These Christians, including many from the White House Faith Initiative, wanted to reach out to the Kurds. While an unofficial visit, their views could inform President Trump about the importance of the Kurdish people. They went to the front lines overlooking the Nineveh Plain and met with the Peshmerga, the Kurdish military, responsible for pushing back ISIS. I wish that every American could stand where we're standing today and get the briefing that we got from the uh, Kurdish military officials who helped to liberate uh, this part of Iraq. Now with the ISIS caliphate basically destroyed, the Kurds and the U.S. face a common enemy, Iran. Shiite militias now control the Nineveh plain. Shia militias are a very serious danger because they are made by Iran and they are against any kind of freedom or human rights. So there is not a lot of differences between them and ISIS. That's Iran. So Iran has a huge voice here in this part of the world, not only in Iran, but they have a huge voice here in Iraq. Iran now largely controls four Mideast capitals, Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad and Tehran. Given rising tension, the delegation sees the Kurds as a natural ally. I think we need to understand that one of the most practical ways that we can love and stand with Israel and bless Israel in these days is to stand with the Kurds. Because if you look at the configuration of the Middle East today, the Kurds, 30 to 40 million people spread throughout Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, that 40 million people is really the bulwark against Iranian expansionism. Kurdish leaders told CBN News they're looking to America. I want the Americans to know that the only allies of the Americans here in the Middle East are Israel and Kurdistan, and we would like them to support us. And they're opposed to the kind of tyranny that Iran represents, and uh, I think they can be a valuable ally to us. The delegation plans to brief the White House about what they learned. 
With Iran and the U.S. on the brink of war, it promises to be a timely report about a key ally in the Middle East. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Iraqi Kurdistan. Thanks, Chris. Pat, I know you've been a longtime supporter of the Kurds. I have. It, it makes, you know, the president wanted to pull out our forces out of that whole area. And, uh, you know, General Maddox resigned because he said, you're going to uh, abandon our Kurdish allies. But look, there are 36 million Kurds. The Kurds are pro-democracy, pro-American, pro-Western. They have a marvelous uh, democratic uh, uh, government, and their ca capital is is a marvel of uh, well, it, of you know, capitalism. And, and the Kurds, 36 million, and I, I would think the president could do himself so much good. And, you know, the Balfour Declaration recognized a homeland for the Jews. All the president has got to do is say, I recognize the legitimacy of the Kurdish people in that part of the world, and they, they ought, ought to have hegemony over northern Iraq and that part of Syria that is now occupied by the Kurds. 36 million people don't have a homeland, and they deserve their own homeland. And it would be a bulwark of, against the Iranians, against the ISIS, against those people who want to destroy our uh, hold in the Middle East. But that would take care of the northern Syria, take care of northern Iraq, and would put a major, major friendly power in charge. All the president would have to do, just like the Balfour Declaration, to become the Trump Declaration, I recognize the legitimacy of the Kurdish people to own that territory that's theirs, and they can have sovereignty over it, then at the same time, instead of trying to send arms through that corrupt group in, in, in uh, uh, Iraq, he can send arms directly. And if the Peshmerga are properly armed, we will not have to worry about that part of the world. America will have, have gained a valuable ally, and there'll be a stabilizing force. It'll stop the Iranian expansion, and it'll stop the Russians from coming into Syria, keep the Chinese out. It would be a marvelous coup. All I can look forward to the Trump Declaration. It would be a brilliant stroke if he'll do it. But I'm, I, I've been saying for years, an independent Kurdistan is a absolutely vital link in our Middle East policy. Let's hope we do it. So something to pray about. John. Well, Pat, tonight, Democratic candidates for president square off in the first of two debates this week. Ten of the 20 candidates will take the stage in Miami. Among them, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker and Beto O'Rourke. Warren picking up a tailwind as she goes into tonight's event. A straw poll from the progressive group MoveOn.org shows its members favor Warren over Bernie Sanders by more than 20 points. Sanders, Joe Biden, and the remaining candidates. Pat, debate tomorrow night. Uh, and what they're saying, we hope that the president will stay out, let the Democrats kill themselves without his interference. And he's going to be overseas, by the way. There's a G20 meeting in Japan. He's going to be out of the country, and maybe he won't be tweeting about how terrible the Democrats are. Wendy? Don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, media watchdog Brent Bozell exposes the news media's desperate attempt to take down President Trump, and he shows how it's backfired after this. Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. I'm delighted to have you with us. I guess I don't have to tell you, but our president, Donald Trump, has received more negative news coverage than any president in the U.S. history. But as Brett Brozell writes in his new book, the media's desperate efforts to destroy the president are really destroying their credibility. Since the moment he declared his candidacy, Donald Trump has faced an unprecedented onslaught of attacks from the press. 
In Unmasked, Big Media's War Against Trump, conservative media watchdogs Brent Bozell and Tim Graham expose how a radicalized news media has made its chief goal to remove President Trump from office and has become a direct threat to democracy. They show how the media knew there was no evidence of Russian collusion, but saturated the airwaves with thousands of reports about Russian collusion anyway. That's enough. Put down the mic. They list the top 10 Trump haters in the media, how the media has openly called for violence and smeared Trump supporters as racist. And they show how this open warfare against President Trump has destroyed the media's own credibility as poll after poll show that Americans no longer believe them. Well, Brett Bozell is joining us now from Washington. And uh, Brett, it's good to have you with us. I remember some years ago, I was a law student at Yale University, and your father and Bill Buckley debated two Yale University law professors. Uh, one was Vern Countryman, the other was a fellow named Fowler Harper. And your father and Bill Buckley demolished those eminent professors. <laughs> it was a fantastic thing. Have you heard about any of that? Oh, they enjoyed it. They were tag teaming. They came out of Yale, and I think it was my dad who was the head of it, and, my, and Bill was his number two. Bill ran the newspaper, and my father was his number two. Uh, and they were roommates, so they, they really enjoyed going out on the road and, and uh, having some fun at other people's expense. I'm glad you, you remember that. Yeah, well, it was a it was a signal moment for us because, I mean, we loved debates like that, and we they used the biggest hall they had, and it was jam packed with people. And as I say, these one was a, a professor in the business school, the other one was a tort professor. So anyhow, that that's one of my memories about him. Well, look, tell us about some of the examples you've run of in this fake news uh, compiled in your book. Uh, can you, can you give us some examples of what they're doing. Well, we looked at many things, um, just just diving down into this question, uh, how bad has this treatment been? And your your piece is, is, is spot on. There's no president in the history of the republic uh, who has received the treatment that this president has received. And, and you don't have to be pro or con with Donald Trump to, to appreciate that there's something very wrong here. When you've got as many uh, bona fides as he has for his first administration, the number of jobs created, unemployment, record unemployment for blacks, for for Hispanics, uh, you know, the, 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 the accomplishments just go on and on. The one I liked, 217,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records were detained in Trump's first year. These are things that you don't hear. All you hear is negative, 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 89% negative, 92% negative, 91% negative, 94% negative. In fact, in, in, in last year, in total, it was 90% negative news coverage. Now, what kind of negative news coverage? You have the bias, and Pat, you and I have discussed this before, and this has been an historical problem, bias by omission, bias by commission, with reporters giving their spin. You also have false news where people are in such a rush to run a story, they don't check and they find out it's false. But then finally, you have what the president has been saying, which is fake news. And reporters are pushing stories they know are false, designed only to hurt the president. They've gotten caught. They've thrown all ethics of journalism out the window. Well, what, what was behind it? Is it because he's challenging uh, sort of the establishment, or is there something greater than that? Well, what can, can account for these vicious uh, attacks? Well, we ask ourselves that question. Why, is, you know, you remember the, the media v. Nixon, the, the media v. Reagan. There were, there's always been an issue with, with the press and a Republican. Why is this so much worse now? I come up with three reasons. Number one, he was challenging Barack Obama's legacy and Hillary Clinton, who was going to solidify that fundamental transformation that Barack Obama had promised into the world of socialism. Donald Trump threatened that directly. Number two, they believe they created this monster as a celebrity from the West Coast with, uh, with The Apprentice and whatnot. And they believe they had to take, down, take him down for making that mistake. Number three, he declared war on them. 
No president has ever declared war on the media the way Donald Trump has. And they don't like it because they're arrogant and they're aloof and they believe they are beyond reproach. Put those three things together and you've got a perfect storm of opposition toward Donald Trump. Give me a couple of examples of this deceit you've pointed out to the media against Trump. Sure, let me give you one, a, a, a good one. Um, shortly after the election, Brian Ross of ABC reported breathlessly that it, it is, turns out that Michael Flynn, uh, uh, Trump's foreign policy advisor, had indeed gone to Russia, had been sent by Donald Trump to Russia to speak with the Russians. This was the, the absolute uh, 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 evidence of collusion. When this story came out, among other things, the market dropped 300 points, so billions of dollars was lost on the market. Everybody reported it breathlessly on his own, you know, CNN, headline news, that sort of things. Turned out there was one little problem with that story. Donald Trump sent Michael Flynn to Russia after he was elected in, in, as his role as national security advisor, doing exactly what he was supposed to do. Brian Ross was suspended, and he later resigned in disgrace. But the damage had been done. This is the kind of story that's been going on every single month. There's a story on this all along, Pat. And I know you've said it, and everyone has said it. There wasn't one lick of evidence of collusion, not one. And yet the media spent the entirety of 2017 and the entirety of 2018 cover this collusion thing. And all of them pointing to Robert Mueller and his report that was going to come out because he was a paradigm of, uh, of honesty and statesmanship and he was going to tell the truth. Fine. He came out with this report. Donald Trump was vindicated. There was no evidence of collusion. So what have they done? They threw him out the window and then the Attorney General Bob Barr out the window who said the same thing and now they're back to covering collusion. Why? Because the Democrats, the Socialist Democrats in Congress want to run this because they want to see Donald Trump removed. So the media just switched and they're now following the Democrats. Right, well, last question. Do you think there is a move among the media that favors, is it socialism? Is it communism? Uh, do they want to take down America? Is that their ultimate goal? You know, Pat, that's such a good question. I believe that the media are leaders of the left. They're not followers of the left. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is not the leader. Uh, AOC and her silliness, she's not the leader. None of the Democrats running for president are the leaders. It's the national news media that have been promoting this agenda. And the question is, how powerful are they? Answer, just imagine they weren't doing it. That means the Republicans and the, and, and the conservatives would be demolishing the other side. How dangerous is this? I think it's a direct threat to democracy itself. When you've got the media that are projecting a narrative to the American people that is false and deliberately false, that threatens the nation. What are they promoting? They're promoting Barack Obama's transformation. I do believe it's socialism, and I do believe that Bernie Sanders is a Marxist because he believes everything that Marxists believe. If the media were doing their jobs, they'd be reporting that. And that's not a biased proposition. That's telling the truth, which is something that, that, that's unfamiliar to them. Red, thank you so much. I'm sorry about the glitch earlier, but uh, you've gotten your message over. Folks, this book is called Unmask, Big uh, Media's War Against Trump. It's a book you ought to read, and I appreciate Brett Brozell for what he's doing to expose an uh, agenda that can be very damaging to you and your future. Well, to see Alan and Lisa Robertson today, you'd never guess that 20 years ago, Alan ordered Lisa out of their house. Lisa was left broken and sobbing in their backyard. Both of them had brought serious baggage into their relationship, beginning long before they were married. In 1999, Duck Dynasty's Alan and Lisa Robertson had been married for 10 years. Alan suspected Lisa was having an affair. And when she confessed, Alan asked her to move out. At that point, I was like, I don't want you here. I don't want you in our house. I don't want to sleep in the same bed with you. Devastated, Lisa knew she had to change her heart. I have nothing. Without God, I have nothing. Betrayed, Alan had to learn to forgive. Their crisis became their turning point. 
20 years later, Alan and Lisa share how they learn to forgive on a daily basis in their book, Desperate Forgiveness, and why they help others do the same. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Alan and Lisa Robertson. Great to see you guys. Thank you. You're the only couple from your whole clan that I haven't interviewed. So there you go. This yeah. is you saved the best for last. I That's did. exactly right. I did. <laughs> well, Alan, the two of you began dating in high school. What had happened and gone on in your life that Lisa was not aware of? Well, I had, uh, <clears throat> of course, our family's history is pretty well documented. Uh, I grew up in a non-Christian home. And but I was actually the best of the, the of the lot. Of because, the worst. Yeah, the, the worst. Because <laughs> I, I went to church, a pastor was up the street, and so uh, you know, I learned all the right things when I became a teenager. Like a lot of teenagers, I, I got drawn to the dark side and it led me to being a prodigal son. Unfortunately, the greatest regret of my life was that I met Lisa at this point mm -hmm. and she was in love with me since middle school. She had stalked me, you know, <laughs> all, all over the playground. And uh, and I so she needed someone to guide her in a good way. Mm. And instead, I corrupted her and made it worse. Lisa, what secret from your past were you hiding? Well, I had several. Um, I guess the first one that I really think links the whole um, past together is that um, whenever I was seven, um, I had a family member who started molesting me. Mm. And that lasted until I was 14. And at that point, I was you know, old enough and big enough to put a stop to it. Um, but then at 16, um, I had been dating a guy for about nine months and found out I was pregnant. Mm. And so I went and talked to my parents and we decided that, you know, the only thing to do with this blob of tissue, mm. because that's what we were told, right. uh, was to get rid of it. And so, of course, you know, now at 53, I know that that was not a blob of tissue, that that was a child that I aborted. Mm. Um, and you know, so you combine all of those and then you go into a marriage and you bring a heck of a lot of baggage with you. Well, 10 years into your marriage, Lisa, all this stuff finally came to a head. What happened? Well, I had been working for um, Al's parents um, uh, doing duck calls. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking orders and someone called one day and it was someone that I used to date. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, small talk became you know, even intimate talk. And so I had an affair. Um, an emotional affair. Right, right. Initially, yeah. Initially, right. yeah. And, um, and then, you know, after that, it was a full-blown affair. Mm. So it, it was... it went on for how long? Uh, 14 months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, the, the thing that plagues me is that I ask God for a way out all the time, every day, because I want it out. And he always showed me the door every single day. He gave me a way out because he does that. If we ask for a way out of sin, he will give us that way out. For me, it was for, it was honesty. Right. And I'd never been honest because, you know, starting at um, seven years old, I couldn't tell mm. um, what was really happening to me. So even you, you saw the door and, and that was, you know, telling Alan, you just couldn't take it at that point. That's right. But Alan, what happened because there was, a, there was a day where you all sat down, the, the kids were in bed, and you finally confronted Lisa. What happened? Well, I did, and uh, you know, because I was going crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be an associate pastor at our church, a large church, and all this is going on in my own life, and so you, you kind of go crazy. And so it was a relief to me when she finally told the truth. But what's interesting, Wendy, is that, when this is what the book is about, whenever she was afraid that I couldn't forgive her, her fear was is that I would walk out that door and never come back. So God was showing her the door of honesty, but I had not been a person who could receive honesty and therefore it led her to think I couldn't forgive her. And so that was really our breaking point. And so in the book, we talk about being desperate and that's what put Lisa on the back you know, yard with her face down in the dirt, pleading to God. That's what put me numb, sitting in my living room chair thinking, how do we get to this point? We were both desperate and broken. Because she had had, you had known about the emotional affair, but you told her, you gave her a warning. That's right. right. And when it, when you found out it was more than just emotions involved, you kicked her out. I did. I said, I don't, I don't want you here. 
Uh, I don't know that I can, where we're going to go with this. I said, but you know, and you, I don't want the girls going with you. And so we were apart. We were separated. And I had a lot of people advise me, you know, she's, cause she had had the emotional affair now an affair. She's never going to change. Mm. You know, you got to move on. And a lot of people in my church were telling me that. And even though you were a, a, an associate pastor exactly, and supposed to be able to forgive, you were having a struggling. Oh, big time, struggling. big time, you know? So what was the next, what happened next? Well, um, at that point, whenever I, and, and, you know, I don't say this lightly, but I had a truth. Um, I threw up the truth. We call it I truth mean, vomit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I really did. Wow. It, I, I just vomited out everything that had gone on, you know, since I was a little girl and just told him everything. Yeah. I mean, probably many things he didn't want to know, <laughs> mm -hmm. but at that point I had to get it out. And whenever I did, it was amazing what God did to to me, inside of me, once I got that out. Yeah. Now, you know, at first I was empty because I thought we, you know, there's no way we're gonna make it, but I went out into the backyard and I just said, you know, God, I don't even know if you're real. I don't know if you hear me, but at this point in my life, if you're real, would you please come and rescue me? Mm. And what's amazing is that I didn't have to um, get, you know, all cleaned up or anything. Right. He came to me right there where I was. Right there in the mud with your That's face. That's exactly in the dirt. right. And your book is called Desperate Forgiveness, Alan. What is desperate forgiveness? Desperate forgiveness is getting to the place where you've tried everything you can to fix whatever your relationship issues are. You're bitter, you're hurt, maybe you're addicted to drugs, you're trying to fill this void with something. And you get so desperate you think there's no answer. I don't I don't know how to fix this. At that point you can finally embrace the forgiveness of God. And then sometimes you need to extend forgiveness to other people to fix a relationship. Sometimes you have to ask for it yeah. because you know, you've been needing for someone to say, I love you, I forgive you. That's where Lisa was. Mm -hmm. She needed to know. And so I just validated what God had already put in her heart. And that is we can forgive, we can move forward. Right. What are some steps you both recommend now to people struggling with similar situations um, who are struggling with forgiveness? Well, I, you know, first and foremost, I would say start now. Yeah, um, right. that's exactly right. Because, you know, I carried this all through my childhood, my teenage years, into my marriage until I was 33 years old mm -hmm. uh, before I allowed God to heal me of, you know, all the things that had gone wrong. Because you were in love with your husband and so the, the affair was just the root of all these things that had happened to you. The darkness, the darkness. that continued to grow inside of me. Yeah. Um, and at that point, whenever, you know, God just took that away from me and he, he did take that away from me. Now it, I had to do the work, you know, and I had to study and, and I had to go through counseling. And he had to forgive. That's right. And that's work. That's exactly and, right. And sometimes that doesn't happen in an instant. It's a daily decision to keep yes. forgiving. You have to say the words and you have to mean them. When you have to say the words and mean them. I, I made a deal with God. God, I know you forgive me. Yeah. I want to forgive Lisa the same way. And that means that I can't bring this up every time we have an argument. And we're 20 years removed now, and I've held to that deal that I made with the Almighty. Praise and you do that every day. Praise the Lord. Well, I, I read in your book that you now are more happily married now than you've ever been. Mm -hmm. You're older and wiser, not that old. Um, <laughs> but um, so happily married after all of this, how can that be? We finally said a few years ago, and it took a long time to say yeah, this, yeah. that we would live through everything again, wow. as bad as it was, our young life, the affairs, all of it, to know that we could get to where we've been for the last 20 years. That's how awesome and blessed our lives have been. We have six grandchildren, mm. we have two children. They're living that same forgiveness that right. they saw in us. And we're their spiritual heroes. And that happens not because you're perfect, but because you're imperfect and willing to show what God can do. Wow, I can't even imagine the hope that you are giving some couple that's watching right Absolutely. now. Um, the book is called Desperate Forgiveness. It's amazing how mercy sets you free. And wow, thank you so much for, for telling your story and being so real and, and raw. So you can also uh, check out our Facebook page to hear more from Alan and Lisa. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. And what is it about you, Robertsons? You guys just keep bringing the books and bringing these amazing <laughs> stories and God is using you guys so, so much. Even after the shows, 
I guess now in reruns. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. two years. Mm -hmm. Because God built us a tremendous platform. And he didn't mean for us to sit on our laurels and say, weren't those guys funny five years ago? <laughs> yeah. It's like, we got work, for, I got work for you to do. So, Amen. and we feel like now we're doing it. Okay. And, and you know, we want to give other people that same hope that we have. Right. Yeah. Um, and so to do that, you have to share it. You have, you have to, to tell your it. story. You have to open your mouth. That's right. Or you know, write the book. That's right. All right. God bless you guys. We'll still ahead. We've got your email. Christy says, heaven is supposed to be the best place ever. So why will we leave it and rule and reign with Jesus on earth during and after the 1,000 years? Your questions, honest answers coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. President Trump is threatening Iran with, quote, great and overwhelming force if the nation attacks anything American. The president tweeting in some areas overwhelming will mean obliteration. This after Iran's leaders criticized the president for the latest round of sanctions against the regime. The president later said he's still open to diplomatic talks, but he would not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Well, the national debt is projected to reach, quote, unprecedented levels in the decades ahead, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. The agency predicts the government's debt will reach 144 percent of the total economy by 2049. That would be the highest ever. Those estimates actually are lower than they were last year, but the CBO warns the growing debt poses substantial risks for the country. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more than 700 Club right after this. The Bible says to train up children in the way they should go. Allison and Ryan Martin want to do just that, and they're using CBN's Superbook to make it happen. Every night at bedtime, the Martins snuggle up to read a Bible story. The next morning, they watch the same Bible story from Superbook. Both children like the story of David and Goliath. I love David and Goliath. Because it's funny, because the parents don't fight them, but a little kid does. He had God with him. Allison is a second-generation homeschooler who spends hours searching for the right materials. She recently discovered Superbook. And I'd never seen anything like that before, not just for children, but for adults, the way that they told the Bible story. When I know there's so much care and effort put into each episode and so much attention to detail to make sure that they are not deterring from God's Word. I think that's why it is such a powerful thing for kids to watch. So Lydia's favorite episode of Superbook is Jesus dying on the cross. And she's very clearly understood oh, that God. sin separates us from a relationship with the Lord. At four, like, that's amazing. <laughs> Allison is so passionate about Superbook, she promotes the Superbook Club on her YouTube channel and blog. Since we've started watching Superbook, I've noticed that both my kids are taking a lot more care with their decisions. Am I going to choose to follow God or am I going to choose to go my own way? So I think it's helpful for them to see in Superbook that Chris and Joy and these Bible characters, they can face these really hard, tough things that seem impossible and they can come out on the other end and say, nothing is impossible with God. If you're not a Superbook Club member, now's the time to join. You'll receive three copies of the newest episode for, you, for your recurring gift of $25 on a credit or debit card, and you'll be one of the first to receive each new episode. Join the Super, Superbook Club today, and we'll send you three copies of our newest DVD, Philip, plus our summer bonus pack called Superbook's Young Heroes of the Bible. It includes three additional episodes, A Giant Adventure, Samuel and the Call of God, and Naaman and the Servant Girl. That's six DVDs for just $25. Call the number on your screen, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to cbn.com to join. Superbook Club members can stream all episodes of seasons one, two, and three for free, and you will get these. Well, up next, your questions, honest answers. Kathy says, my 12-year-old granddaughter has seen angels a couple of times and once an evil presence. What does this mean? And what, if anything, should we do? Stay tuned for Pat's answers and more after this.
Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. Let's start with this question from Christy. Heaven is supposed to be the best place ever. So why will we leave it and rule and reign with Jesus on earth during and after the 1,000 years? Wouldn't we want to be with God in heaven instead? <laughs> why would God want us to be on earth instead of heaven? Good question, Christy. You know, I wonder where you all get this stuff. <laughs> Look, this earth, this earth is a beautiful place. We have sin. We have dictators. We have hatred and warfare. We have disease. We have satanic presence. You know, and when you look at what, you know, the idea, Jesus said, I'm going to send my angels that will take out of my kingdom all that offense. We've got the idea that the, the, the good people get raptured and the bad people get to run the earth. You know, my friend Speed Wilson, who was a colonel in the Marine Corps, said he thinks that what's going to happen is the bad people are going to get taken out and we're going to get to this earth. The earth is a pretty nice place. So, you see, they lived again and they reigned and ruled for a thousand years. Well, if you look at the book of Revelation, there's, there's a lot of confusion, but it says, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven uh, from God. And the new Jerusalem was a cube that was about the distance between, uh, say, New York and Chicago, three dimensions. And uh, that was the new Jerusalem. So that came to earth. So I wouldn't spend an awful lot of time worrying about what's going to happen after the thousand years. I mean, the big thing is occupied till he comes. Get to please the Lord right now. That's the job we have, not to speculate, you know. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but, you know, you're going to get the baptism of the Spirit and you'll be my witnesses. That's what your concern should be. In all seriousness, I mean, this other speculation is just a waste of time. All right. <laughs> all right. Kathy writes, my granddaughter has seen angels a couple of times and once an evil presence. She's 12 years old, and this has been occurring for many years. I heard a pastor say seeing angels actually could be demons instead of angels. The angels were huge and gave her a peaceful sense. The evil presence scared her. What does this mean, and what, if anything, should we do? Yeah. I, uh, Jesus said uh, they're, they're angels. The, the little children, let them come to me. He said, they're angels. Always behold the face of my Father in heaven. So it's as if these little children have angelic beings. And uh, I, I have no question that little children can look into the invisible world and they can see things that most of us, quote, sophisticated adults can't see. Um, I, I don't know what your granddaughter saw. I, I can't, how can I speculate on that? Because I wasn't there. But I do think that angelic angels are huge. And they are very powerful beings. And if she feels peace in their presence, then I would say it's the real thing. I wouldn't say every revelation of, to a child is a demon. That's ridiculous. I think their angels always behold the face of my Father in heaven. So I think that's what you want to rest on. All right. All right. Jennifer says, I attended a church for many years that taught strict obedience to a pastor's teachings, whether those things were specifically noted in the Bible or not. We were told what type of clothing was acceptable, how long or short hair could be, not to wear jewelry. I left this church for many reasons, but several of the church members said it was because of disobedience in my heart. My question is, does the Bible give pastors the authority to tell us we can or cannot do these things? Uh, there was a group uh, called Shepherding that tried to get that kind of power over their disciples. God never gave human beings that kind of authority over one another. It's wrong. It's demonic. I mean, there's a spirit of witchcraft that wants to have that kind of control. It has nothing to do with your spirit of disobedience. You shouldn't have to be under the control of some person who wants to dominate you. Uh, Sounds the, like a cult, more like well, than a it church. It does sound like a cult. It's exactly the way cults. That that's the Jim Jones, mm -hmm. uh, Jonestown uh, example. You know, drink the Kool Aid and die. Uh, you know, I, I just if you're involved in that, get out. It has nothing to do with you. We should have a teachable spirit. We should be careful of those who have authority over us because they're supposed to watch over our souls. 
and there's a, a pastor supposed to shepherd the flock and and be good to them and make sure that the wolf doesn't come and eat them. But I think uh, as far as telling them who to marry and what kind of car to drive and uh, how much money they're supposed to make and what profession they're supposed to be in, that's, a, that's between them and the Lord. And I think anybody who is a true pastor who wants to make sure his people have their direction directly from the Lord and by the Holy Spirit and from the Scriptures, that's where we should get our direction, not from some dominant pastor. If you're involved in something like that, get out. Good word. Good advice there. All right. Here's one from John. He says, hello, Pat. Am I correct in thinking that fear God really means respect God? Also, what do the words Selah and Abba mean? Well, Abba is a, a Aramaic for father. Uh, you know, Abba for father. Uh, he's speaking Aramaic. And it's kind of like daddy. Uh, so that's what Abba means. Selah is just the way they they they, they closed out a a, a a psalm which was meant to be sung, and so Selah just means that's the end of the song. Okay. I think it means pause, right? Pause. It's a pause. Well, it's the end of the song. I mean. Right. Yeah. And then fear God, respect God, same thing, right? Well, it's it's reverence. I mean, you know, you you fear Him, uh, but you know, but the, we're told to love Him and fear Him. But the fear is to respect the fact that he is God Almighty. And uh, I remember Catherine Coombe used to say, I think we're too familiar with God. And I think the idea of coming into the presence of God in dirty over overshoes is just not appropriate. We need to be reverence in the way in dealing with God Almighty. But uh, you, you, fear doesn't mean you're afraid of him. It means that you respect him. Okay. Here's one from Paul. If drinking alcohol is a sin, then why did Jesus turn the water into wine for people to drink at weddings? I once went to a church that held their services in a bar before the bar opened for business, yet the pastor got mad at me for stating that I thought about ordering a beer to drink during service. Okay, you wonder where I get these questions. Uh, <laughs> Jesus turned water into wine. And drinking wine was not considered a sin. The Bible says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And to the misuse these things uh, is what's called alcoholism. And the, this, we turn ourselves over to somebody else. But I think, you know, you read the Bible, it says wine to gladden the heart of man. Uh, it's, it's not a sin to drink wine. Jesus wasn't sinning when he turned the water into wine. Well, I, I know some people thought he turned into grape juice. That's not what it was. <laughs> All right. Today's Power Minute is from the book of Matthew. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. That's all the time we've got. Thanks for being with us. See you, Lord willing, tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>